Hey, good afternoon. Um, my role here, um, as was mentioned, I work in CEDAR's Office of Executive Programs. So my role currently is of the GADUFA 2, I'm the GADUFA 2 implementation lead for the center. And before I jump into generics, I have to give one shout out to the Tar Heels. I don't know if anyone else is a basketball fan here, but <laughs> that's where I did my undergrad, so go Tar Heels. So today I'm going to briefly summarize the reauthorization process, basically how we got from GADUFA 1 to GADUFA 2, or how we're going to get there. I'll discuss some of the highlights from the GADUFA 2 commitment letter, and I'll point out mainly some of the differences between GADUFA 1 and GADUFA 2. So please note that my talk is not comprehensive. I'm not going to talk about all the parts of GADUFA 2, just the highlights. And Donald Park spoke earlier. He did a great job talking about the fees portion, so I'm not going to cover the fees at all. So GADUFA 1 actually outlines the process for reauthorization that we followed. The process began in June of 2015 with a public meeting. Shortly thereafter, FDA and industry started negotiations. During negotiations, FDA and industry basically discuss the parameters of what an agreement would look like. So industry pays agreed upon fees, and FDA fulfills agreed upon commitments. So while negotiations were being held, FDA held monthly meetings with stakeholders. Both parties agreed upon a proposed user fee commitment letter in the fall of last year, at which time a second public meeting was held. A user fee package was transmitted to Congress earlier this year. So the House Energy and Commerce Committee, or the ENC Committee, and the Senate Health Committee, so that's Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, those committees held hearings um, last month. So the next steps that we anticipate would be for Congress and President to authorize. So let's start with the submission review performance goals. I know some other speakers have touched a little bit on this, so um, some of it's a bit of a review. The DUFA 1 and uh, review goals were complex, and there were differential treatment for different cohorts and tiers of submissions. In addition to informal target action dates, or TADs, these were given out to thousands of submissions, which added an additional layer of complexity. In GADUFA 2, all ANDAs and ANDA amendments fall within a single consolidated review scheme. A new proposed um, goal scheme, this new proposed goal scheme, uh, simplifies and streamlines the program administration. So we're going to hope the, the aim there is to improve review efficiency. So FDA can focus more on the ANDA review and less on administering the program. So all performance goals are for FDA to act, to review and act on 90% of applications, supplements, and amendments within a specified time. So GADUFA 2 proposes standard and priority review timelines. The review timeline for a standard original ANDA submission is 10 months. So this is unchanged in, from GADUFA 1. The review timeline for a priority original and a submission is eight months. So the key aspect of a priority review is that applicants need to submit a pre-submission facility correspondence, or a PFC. Again, I think we've heard this term a couple times today. So this needs to be submitted to FDA two months prior to submission of the ANDA. Now this aspect is new for GDP2. So this correspondence should be complete and accurate and contain information related to manufacturing and testing facilities, as well as bioequivalence and clinical study information. So the review timeline for a priority original and a submission, if the applicant does not submit a PFC, or if the PFC is submitted but the facility information changes or it's found to be incomplete or inaccurate, that review timeline is months. So FDA intends to be able to accept ANDAs on October 1, 2017 for priority review. So that means backing it up, FDA intends to accept PFCs prior to October 1.
So the review timeline for a standard major amendment is 10 months. If the pre-approval inspection, if a pre-approval inspection is required, and eight months if a pre-approval inspection is not required. So this is unchanged from good news one. The review timeline for a priority major amendment is eight months. Again, um, if a prior approval inspection is required and the applicant submits their PFC two months prior to the submission of their ANDA. The review timeline for a priority major amendment is six months if a pre-approval inspection is not required. So the review timeline for a standard or priority minor amendment to an original ANDA is three months. Review timeline for a standard priority approval supplement is 10 months if an inspection is required and six months if it's not required. And the review timeline for a priority prior approval supplement is eight months if inspection is required and the applicant submits a PFC, if there's no pre-approval inspection required, then it's four months. The review timelines for a major amendment submitted to a prior approval supplement are the same as for those for a prior approval supplement. And then the review timelines for a standard or priority minor amendment to a prior approval supplement is three months. So shifting gears here, the proposed GDUFA 2 and a review procedures are much more specific and programmatic than corresponding features from GDUFA 1. The idea was to refine and enhance each stage of the ANDA review process from start to finish. So some highlights of the review program enhancements include, in the FDA acceptance letter, the letter will state whether the original ANDA or, a, or the prior approval supplement is subject to a standard or priority review. FDA will communicate if the review classification changes from standard to priority. Note that once an ANDA or a prior approval supplement is classified as having a priority review, that classification will not change until FDA takes an action. FDA will issue information request, information request letters as was done previously. What's new for GDUFA 2 is that FDA will issue a discipline IR letter or a discipline review letter from each review discipline as soon as the discipline has completed its review at or about the midpoint of the review. So this will promote transparency and communication between FDA and applicants and provide more opportunities for applicants to address deficiencies during their current review cycle. In the event FDA issues a complete response letter, applicants may request a post-complete response letter telecon. FDA will schedule the telecon within 10 days and then hold the telecon within 30 days. So rounding out some of the enhancements from the ANDA review program, the DUFA 2 proposes a 30-day goal date for FDA to respond to a request for formal dispute resolution. The DUFA 1 had aspirational goals for formal dispute resolution, so there's a difference there. So a complex product is a term defined in the GDUFA 2 commitment letter, and we heard a little bit from one of the previous speakers more about um, what a complex product is. So just real quick, a complex product generally includes products that are um, that with complex active ingredients, complex formulations, routes of delivery, or dosage form. Products can also have a complex drug and device combination. And also, it could be other products where complexity or uncertainty concerning the approval pathway or other alternative approach would benefit from early scientific engagement with the FDA. GDUFA 2 proposes a pre and a program for complex products in order to clarify regulatory expectations for prospective applicants early in their product development and help applicants develop more complete submissions. 
The GDUFA 2 letter outlines three types of meetings for complex products. There's product development, pre-submission, and mid-cycle review. Product development meetings are an opportunity for FDA and industry to have a scientific exchange on specific issues or questions. For example, questions, the questions could be regarding a proposed study design. This is a meeting where FDA can provide targeted advice to an ongoing ANDA development program. Pre-submission meetings give the applicant an opportunity to discuss and explain the content and format of an ANDA prior to submission. Note that the content and format discussion would not include a, subs like a, a, a discussion of the data itself. After the last key discipline has issued an IR or a discipline review letter, FDA would schedule a mid-cycle review meeting with the applicant to discuss current concerns with, you know, that are there with the ANDA, if there are any, and then potential next steps. So FDA would issue guidance describing this, in, this enhanced pathway for complex products, and this guidance will cover meeting policies and procedures. So GDUFA 2 also proposes enhancements in the area of regulatory science. Again, we heard a lot about that earlier. And enhancements to an inactive, to the inactive ingredient database. And there will also be a separate review timeline for complex controlled correspondence. So that review timeline is 120 days from the submission date, as opposed to 60 days for a standard controlled correspondence. GDUFA 2 proposes some targeted improvements to the DMF review, so that's drug master file review. FDA would perform a complete assessment for 90% of type 1 API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, DMFs within 60 days of the latter of the DMF submission or the DMF fee payment. FDA would ensure that DMF review comments submitted to the DMF holder are issued at least in parallel with the issuance of the review comments related to the DMF for the ANDA. GDUFA 2 outlines procedures and timelines for telecons and email exchanges to clarify DMF first cycle review deficiencies. Once a DMF has undergone a complete review, and has no open issues related to the referencing ANDA, FDA would issue a first adequate letter. Once a DMF has undergone a complete review, and the ANDA referencing it has been approved or tentatively approved, FDA would issue a no further comment letter. By, 20, by fiscal year 2019, FDA would issue a guidance on post-approval changes to a type 2 DMF and submission mechanisms for ANDA applicants who reference it. So the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, or FDASIA, or FDASIA eliminated long-standing minimal surveillance inspection frequency requirements and directed FDA to inspect drug facilities globally on the basis of risk. The transition to this new paradigm we acknowledge has been disruptive for industry. It's something new. As industry over time, you developed expectations and business processes around the old model, and of course now there's a new model. So while facility assessment cuts across multiple FDA drug programs, GDUFA 2 contains several facility-related enhancements targeted specifically to the generic drug industry. So to mitigate export-related challenges identified by U.S.-based pharmaceutical, active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturers, FDA would issue guidance explaining the risk-based site selection model used to prioritize facilities for surveillance inspection. So earlier today, too, we heard um, from OPQ a little bit about their risk-based site selection. FDA would also undertake outreach to foreign regulators so that they can understand our model. And FDA will also issue communications to foreign regulators conveying the current 
compliance status of U.S. manufacturing facilities. So to mitigate and to sponsor concerns regarding transparency and speed of facility assessment and its impact on an ANDA approvability and a product launch, FDA will communicate to the applicant either through an IR, a discipline review letter, or a complete response letter when outstanding facility issues have been identified on an inspection that could prevent approval of an ANDA or a prior approval supplement. FDA will also communicate to the facility owner the final inspection classifications that do not negatively impact approvability of a pending application within 90 days of the inspection. And in order to enhance transparency concerning the compliance status of GDUFA self-identified facilities and sites, FDA will update the existing publicly available compliance status database. So the final chapter of the GDUFA 2 commitment letter deals with accountability and reporting enhancements. FDA would conduct activities to develop a resource management planning function and modernize time reporting. FDA would obtain a contract with a third party. So the third party would evaluate options and provide recommendations for a new methodology to accurately assess changes in resource needs and how to monitor and report on those changes going forward. So this report would be published online for public comment. So upon receiving the comments, FDA would implement basically these robust methodologies for assessing resource needs of the program and tracking resource allocation across the program. So when we say across the program, we mean you know, the center has multiple offices with multiple disciplines. So internally, we sort of use the term like capacity planning for this, sort of the umbrella term. So FDA is committed to ensuring the DUFA 2 resources are administered, allocated, and reported in an efficient and transparent manner. So FDA would evaluate the financial administration of the program to help identify areas to enhance operational and fiscal efficiencies. So FDA would also expand and enhance GDUFA program performance reporting. So in the letter itself, there will be reporting. We have commitments for reporting monthly, quarterly, and annually with the annual report to Congress. So the new aspects are the monthly and quarterly as being part of the program. So this reporting hopefully will enable regulated industry, patient groups, consumer groups, and other stakeholders to really better gauge the performance of the program. So yes, thank you. So that's those are the highlights from Gadufa too. Thank you. And Amy will be back uh, for our panel discussion at 3:45. But to keep us moving along, I'm going to turn it over to Hina to introduce our next speaker. Sure. Our next speaker is Elaine Lipman. Ms. Lip Lipman serves as a regulatory counsel in the Office of Regulatory Policy and FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Oh, that's my mic. <laughs> Ms. Lipman provides oversight and leadership in the development of regulations, policies, procedures, and guidances that affect the drug approval process and in the development of new legislation. All right, everyone, please welcome Ms. Lipman. I didn't mean to start with a screech. I apologize. Um, good afternoon, everybody. This is going to be a, quite a shift in gears here. I'm going to talk to you about the development of single shared system RANs, which is a topic.